by Hyundai. We just watched the 30 for 30 film Breakaway, focused on the story of Maya Moore and John Irons and so much more than that. It is emotional, it is depressing, it is inspiring. I'm feeling so much right now. How do you feel, Mr. Rose? I feel the exact same way. And cases like this, Jacoby, um, continue to permeate themselves, unfortunately, today in society. Maya Moore got discovered this case from her uncle when she was in her teens. And for him now just to find himself to be free and exonerated from everything that happens, it makes us just take a deeper thought into how many cases can and would be different. How many families have been affected in an adverse way when circumstances and evidence isn't always brought forward in cases like this. And so I'm happy that he has his freedom and they have their love and happiness. That's kind of where I wanted to go. I mean, this is an emotional roller coaster, it's such a well crafted film. And not all films end like this, but this does have sort of an uplifting ending with their love and what came from this. And at the end of the day, while you know I'm in an emotional state, so I'm gonna talk like this. When you're sort of spending time on this planet, what else do you have than the people that you spend time with at the end of the day and the, the connections that you create? And their, their connection and their love, you can see from the screen, seems so genuine and passionate. And I'm just so happy for the two of them. I'm upset about the process that got them here. But at the end of the film, I'm just so happy that they're here now. At one of her visits back to Missouri, we just had stuff spread out everywhere. And Maya asked about it. And I asked her, would you like to get on his visiting list and you can go with us and meet him? I just had a piece about it because if Sherry and Reggie were going, then I knew I was I was good. I was safe if they were going and, and just wanted to meet Jonathan. In my mind, I'm thinking she's probably going to be afraid of me. I just felt like, you know, she's going to judge me, probably think I'm guilty. I'll never forget it. She came in, she hugged me, and she looked me directly in the eye. And I just felt this, this sense of of peace being around her. I just can't believe how down earth she is. I just feel like that living it out is the first step of, I need to know somebody. I need to get outside of my comfort zone and, and put myself in someone's world who isn't exactly like me. You know, you can go down the line of, I wasn't in his world. We're both black, but the black experience can be buried. So looking back though, I didn't know that's what I was doing. I was just leaning into something that was already happening in my family. Let's acknowledge who Maya Moore is as an athlete and why many people know her as a public figure. And that stage started for her at UConn, playing under Gina Auriemma. And I believe along with Diana Taurasi, her to Burr, those are the greatest players to come out of UConn. Would you argue with that? Is that fair no. to say? Yes. And she has, hasn't gone two seasons without winning a championship since high school. Okay. She's the only WNBA player to score double figures every game she's played. She was the first woman to sign a major contract with Nike as a member of the WNBA, a champion in college, a champion in the NBA, to take this case and make it your life mission and walk away from your career. Michael Jordan lost his dad and his love for the game. And because of his dad, he fell in love with baseball. And to pay homage to his dad, he played baseball for a couple of years before he came back to the NBA. Maya Moore took this case up, Jacoby, and has not been back to the WNBA. No. Has not been back to the WNBA. So for her to have this love, this passion for this case, and for him to be exonerated, it's really refreshing to see somebody stand on their principles for so very long and own it like she did. And again, like we, I just want to celebrate who she was on the court some more before we start talking about this case and this story. Like 
multiple championships in college, multiple championships in the WNBA finals MVP. And let's not leave out two Olympic gold medals, two world Mm. championships with the national Mm. team. Like this is like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar level of the success on all phases of her career. Like she is arguably the GOAT. I mean, I'm not going to sit here after watching this movie and talk about who's the greatest of all time in the WNBA, but she is in the conversation. And one word I know is very important to you because, you know, we, we've, we've had millions of conversations over the decade. We've been partners doing this show is sacrifice. Like you mm. always talk about sacrifice because you've sacrificed a lot in your life and there is no sacrifice in her life, in her career larger than what she did. She walked away from the game. What do you think about her sacrifice? And also when you choose to walk away from the game and make that sacrifice and make that decision, it's just, it, there, there's no I in team. When Maya made the decision to step away from the game, I felt conflicted. Like, I don't, I don't want to be the reason for that. And, you know, she explained to me, it's like, like it's not just about that. I want to prioritize some other things and it's centered around family and ministry, which I, th- I see as one thing. That's, that's my first ministry is my family and wanting to be more present for that, to rest some and to have the space to be more engaged in some really, really critical things. Uh, some privately off the court, non-public, and then some more public. So she has to go to her franchise, go to her coaching staff, go to her teammates, and now their squad has to look not as good without her in uniform. That's a big difference in everyone's lives. You know how this works in sports. Right now we're having the NBA Finals. We're gonna highlight the superstars, Giannis, Chris Paul, Devin Booker. But when you look deeper into the box score, you need all of your players to be engaged in order for excellence to happen. She's the best player. She's the go-to player. She's the face of the franchise. But you know what else I learned? they were all extremely supportive and that allowed her to make that decision a lot easier because imagine if they gave her some turbulence, like really you're going to lead a game for this or for that or for this and that. Can't you do both? The sacrifice you talked about is the 10 toes down decision. I can't fully concentrate on being one of the all time great basketball players. It's going to cloud my judgment based on what's in my heart. And what's in my heart is to do everything I can to see if I can get this case overturned. So let's talk about the case itself. In the 90s, John Irons is um, convicted of burglary. Now, one thing that's important, I want to start here, is we talk about justice and the justice system. He's convicted of burglary. When he's on the stand, he looks at the jurors, and he looks like you, Every single one of the jurors, a completely all white jury pool. How do you feel about that in the justice system during the 90s? Well, they say you're being judged by your peers. Mm -hmm. What you just described doesn't sound like that. And Ice Cube once famously said it in the record, I'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. Right. And what does that mean? I don't want to go the route to not be on this earth anymore. I don't mind putting my life in the hands of these 12 jurors, but are they going to be fair by me? And as you mentioned the nineties, there was a, a famous case involving OJ where there was a lot of talk about the jurors and the peers and the selection of the people that were on the jury. This is something that's permeated throughout society and the justice system since the beginning of time. You can look at the, if you did a bulletin or a Zoom or all of the judges and magistrates in the country and many of the jurors in cases that you just described, we're the minority in a lot of those situations. And an important thing that was learned in this documentary is that when he initially got convicted, they said that there were only one set of fingerprints at the scene of the crime. Mm -hmm. But what got uncovered is that there were three. That's a big difference. Mm -hmm. 
That's a major difference. That's the difference between somebody spending decades in jail or not. And that information was purposely withheld. And there are so many people that are black or brown that are in the justice system. And a lot of things were started to criminalize them, like the war on drugs. I remember as we started to change presidents, how all of a sudden the prison, po the prison population started to increase. And you started to take people out of their homes for things that are now considered recreation and or legal. The criminalization of how cocaine was legislated for the suburbs versus crack rock was legislated for the inner city and how the loss for the minimum time was vastly different for the crimes to protect one versus the other. And so I'm not surprised, was not surprised when I saw that he was being judged in theory, quote unquote, by his peers, yet the most important time at that point of his life, it actually didn't represent that. And that happens way too often in the justice system. Absolutely. If you're just joining us, you're watching the Jalen Jacoby After Show presented by Hyundai. We're discussing 30 for 30 Breakaway, the story of Maya Moore and the case of John Irons and basically a, a family that's come out of this. And one thing that's so complex about this film and even discussing it is we can discuss the injustice, the the disgusting life that was, I mean, the, 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 the the unvalue of this man's life, John Irons, how it wasn't valued. It wasn't treated just. He didn't get a fair trial. However, there's also some triumphs in this. And there's some emotional connections and human stories that are weaved throughout this film, which makes it so nuanced and complex. One is the gentleman by the name of Hugh Flowers, who was involved in the church and the prison and became a father figure to John Irons, someone who didn't have a father. I saw Mr. Flowers come in. He's the choir director. As a teacher of music for 46 years, I was always able to determine the very smart kids. And when I met Jonathan, I was impressed with his intelligence. And so I became enamored of him. He said, you have to sing from your diaphragm. <laughs> Can you some exercises? Did, did a scale note, do re mi so ba la ti do. It's like, huh, you have perfect pitch. Do you know what that is? I'm like, no. <laughs> so <laughs> he starts explaining it to me. I felt like I was the first teacher who, man, I need some toilet paper. I was the first teacher I had who, who actually took the time to, to reach me. He was the first person who made me feel intelligent for the right reasons. I was like, hey man, look, let me be honest with you. Man, I love you, dude. Like, will you be my dad? And he laughed. <laughs> he said, he said, yeah. Like, for real? He's like, yeah. Jalen, you famously didn't have a relationship with your biological father. When it came to that part of the film and him asking Hugh Flowers to be his father and Hugh sort of immediately accepting that role, how do you feel as someone who didn't have a biological father? Well, those roles become important, whether they're your brothers, your uncles, mentors, coaches. As you know, I have a godfather as well. And to have those voices of reason in your mind a lot of time represent sanity. Mm -hmm. He's in jail, he's locked up. And so now all of a sudden when your freedom is taken away from you, how do you respond? And he didn't respond so well to it and rightfully so. So he needed this guidance. He needed this voice to put him on a track psychologically to put himself in position to cope with whatever might happen. And always, there's a difference between knowing when to give somebody a pat on the back or a kick in the butt. 
And so a lot of times you truly don't get real advice. You know why? Because you don't tell all of the story to the people that you hope that you want to advise you. If you give me part of the story, I'm going to give you partial advice unknowingly. So also it was important for him to open up to this mentor, open up to this confidant and be vulnerable. And in society as a man and as a black man, we're guarded for being vulnerable because a lot of times you feel like that's going to be taken advantage of or taken for granted. And so that psychological barrier that he was able to accomplish by investing in this relationship is one of the lead dominoes along with the work that was being done by Maya and attorneys and her uncle and for so many people that was her family was that was there on his behalf. But that relationship was there with him. That wasn't a visit. See, they get to come and go. They get to call and hang up. He still got to be there. And that relationship was extremely important for him. One thing that we've discussed a lot on our show, Jalen and Jacoby, that um, is frankly underappreciated in our society, in sports media in particular, is there's so much discussion, especially in the last two years, I would say, about the role of athletes in activism. And always, almost 100% of the time leading the way are the WNBA players and the WNBA as a league. And this is just another example of that with Maya Moore. Why do you think that the WNBA is always at the forefront when it comes to the intersection of activism and athletics? So this comment might hit a lot of human beings in between the eyeballs, but it's important to give a level of context. And that's why Hyundai wanted Jalen and Jacoby to do this after show because we're going to shoot it to you straight. It's because the WNBA features primarily 80% of black women. And they've been ostracized in so many ways by society. And so when they get a chance to be a collective, that's extremely powerful. The NBA players went into the bubble and both leagues did a terrific job of getting us to a champion and getting social justice messages out there. And the NBA players had Black Lives Matter, one message on the floor, but they also had 29 messages on the back of the jerseys. The WNBA players spoke in one voice. They had one name on the back of their jerseys. And also, they're the only league currently that has come out to announce that each of their players have been fully vaccinated. So it's not just talk, it's action. And like you said, they have been at the forefront and I truly appreciate it. And this film, 30 for 30 Breakaway, it's, it was such a good experience and something that was so important for me because it is common knowledge that Maya Moore walked away from the WNBA to help John Iron's case. That is something that we know, but you know what? We kind of pay it lip service. I didn't read the full New York Times article. I, did, I didn't get really deep into the exact case. And then we find out she got married. That's another headline. But sometimes you have to read the entire article and not just the headline. And that's why this film was so satisfying for me, because I knew that Maya Moore walked away. And I knew that she formed a relationship with him, but I didn't know that this was an entire family effort from Maya and Correct. her uncle. And I didn't know yes. the time and the I hours that her uncle spent. Like her uncle dedicated his life to helping another man who was incarcerated. It just it, it was blind faith. And I didn't know about the police not handing over important evidence in the case to the defense attorneys that could have exonerated this man. I didn't know about the decades he spent behind bars and the relationships that he formed there. And that, that's one of the reasons that it's so important to get all of the details. It's so important to pay attention to everything and not just read the headlines. And that's what I found so satisfying about this film. Your thoughts, Mr. Rose. And also, as you alluded to the jury and the justice system, that's why it's important that words matter. And if I say my black life matters, it doesn't dismiss, demean, or take away from anyone else's. I want to uplift everyone. 
I, I, I want to see each human being have an opportunity, an equal one. And so when people get defensive for that statement, that to me becomes a trigger for the conversation, Jacoby, because mm-hmm. you're talking about a system that was put in place and a lot of people will say it's broken, but how can it be when it was built this way? This is how it was set up. And we're talking about police falsifying reports. Oh, let me give you two examples of when that took place. The murder of Breonna Taylor. When you get a chance, look at the police report. It doesn't say she was killed. When you get a chance, look at Freddie Gray's police report, who was killed in police custody. I can name way too many of these cases, sadly. And so while there has been progress and we continue to root for progress, cases like this give a give me hope that when somebody's on trial for their life, that officers don't get a chance to falsify a report and say, it was only one set of fingerprints when there were actually three. So Jalen, let me paint a picture for you. Brief story. In my a neighborhood in Los Angeles, there's this old couple that used to walk down the street every night around sunset and they would walk very slowly and they would walk even five feet apart from each other. And, and me and my wife would look at them and say, you know what? I, I, I want to be just like them. I want to be just like them. And I want to paint a picture. Imagine John Irons and Maya Moore, gray, hunched over sitting on the front porch (laughs) on the swing and she looks over at him and he looks over at her and they give each other a kiss in that moment do you think Maya Moore is going to regret walking away from basketball no I think Maya Moore is going to think you know what maybe I had three more good years maybe a couple more championships maybe the trophy case could be a little bit bigger like in that moment what Maya Moore sacrificed some tells me she's not going to regret I say no and agree with you, but just as a fan, I say never say never because she's so very extremely talented and the game physically does miss her and her ability. Like just Mm -hmm. her long arms and her long legs, how they move with her torso and how smooth and graceful she looks out on the floor and how competitive she was as a player. It would be great to see her out there performing, but you know what's better? is that she understands that there's the score of the game and there's the game of life. And that's what you just described. And she has definitely won both. And what a great film, 30 for 30 Breakaway. It's just a, Check a it film out. about Check it basketball, out. a film about injustice, a film about relationships, family, passion, an excellent film. And Jalen, I appreciate your time. And I appreciate you all for tuning in to the Jalen and Jacoby After Show presented by Hyundai. Thank you. Thank you. You're far too kind.